like the real deal now. You're gonna kick this sorry ass out on the street. <laughs> what you got? You used to think you own the street. Put back your bags and your ass is dead meat. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? And welcome to the Lowdown Show Remix, right here on No Holds Bar Wrestling Podcast. We are your Canadian WWE podcast that talks about NXT and the WWE and No Holds Bar on anything we say, pun intended. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at No Holds Bar WP. You can also follow myself at at Corporate Cappy. You can also follow my usual co-host, the self-proclaimed greatest host, at Real Kyle Masters, who is the self-proclaimed greatest host, Kyle Masters. If you wish to follow the podcast and listen to it on the go, you can listen to it on Spreaker, iTunes, or Stitcher. Or if you go and download the glorious Spreaker app, you can chat with us live there during all Lowdown shows each week on Spreaker.com. And you can go give us a subscribe also on YouTube.com slash NHBWR and hit that bell icon for all upload updates. And with that, I am your host, the self-proclaimed... Oh, wait a minute. No, I am not the self-proclaimed greatest host. I am the blissful boss, Mr. Corporate himself, Corporate Cappy, hosting the show solo tonight uh, as Kyle Masters is not feeling too great tonight. So hopefully he feels better for next week. And hopefully I can fill the shoes as uh, as for the self-proclaimed greatest host this week as it's... Uh, it's probably the only, the second time I've ever done one of these. Um, I just want to make sure I'm live and everything's going right here. So, uh, checking out Spreaker, there we go. So again, this is my first time hosting the Lowdown Show uh, solo. I did do one episode by myself, which was a um, Alexa Bliss Spotlight uh, episode, which I do hope to bring back at some point. So... We're going to see how Kyle does this uh, by himself all the time. And uh, again, without Kyle, this podcast doesn't go. So uh, I'm going to try my best, but I definitely wouldn't be able to do this every week. And hopefully we have him back next week. Uh, It's going to be a big week for the podcast. We're probably going to have our Slammy show. And uh, yeah, a lot of big things going into 2017. Or 2017, my God. 2018 for the podcast. So, uh, as for... NXT this week, it was shown live on the USA Network for the first time, so that was interesting. Um, we never had that before, usually it's just on the network. Um, I was kind of expecting like a, them to showcase everybody, since not a lot of people have uh, that watch the main roster product on USA have um, the WWE Network, so I was interesting to see if they were going to really stack the show as far as giving us a lot, showcasing a lot of people that are on NXT and what NXT is all about. But um, for me, it just seemed like, I don't know, they had some good stuff, but for people that don't watch NXT a lot, they didn't really understand like what it was all about. Like It's more of a wrestling-based show, but other than that, like we didn't really get to see all the characters and what and what makes NXT special, but we did get a pretty good episode of NXT, I will say. There was some good stuff that went on. So, oh, Cupid Girl, hey, what's going on? I'm very blissful today for that uh, that Alexa Bliss Funko Pop I got in today from the pre-order. It was pretty sweet. I uh, can't wait to add that to the collection. But uh, for as far as NXT goes, I don't know. It, like I said, it was okay. And there was some good spots of it, but I really thought that they were going to, especially for the casual fans that don't watch NXT every week, I really thought they were going to do a lot to, like, explain and showcase, like, everybody who's, you know, usually big contenders on NXT. And again, it was only, like, a 45-minute show because of it being on the USA Network, they had to have, you know, the typical commercials. So NXT usually on the network goes for about, I don't know, 50, 55 minutes because there's really no commercials. They kind of have, like, one commercial in between. But, so I understand why they couldn't really do a lot with the time constraints and basically one, uh, what am I trying to say? They basically had like, I don't know, for one hour show, they could only do so much, especially if they had like three commercials in it. So we didn't get to see that here in Canada, since we don't have USA Network, so we had to watch it on uh, the network an hour late, but who cares? I mean, NXT's pre-taped anyway, 
I don't usually check the spoilers for it. So the first match was interesting. We had the new, and I'm still shocking to even say this, but the NXT champion Andrade Cien Almas, with obviously Zelina Vega, who is basically like his, you know, his MVP, I, I should say, or making the difference for Almas in becoming NXT champion, against Fabian Eichner. The Italian-born Fabian Eichner. If you guys don't remember this guy, he was in the Cruiserweight Classic, um, and then now he's just really like become shredded, and he's gotten a lot bigger now. So I, <laughs> I don't really think he would be able to um, <laughs> to crack the 205 Live roster right now. But then again, there are some guys on there that I doubt are 205 pounds. Uh, yep, Michael Chow, the champ is here until I dethrone at the Slammies. Yep, Michael Chow won our Twitter fan of the year. Um, he is, uh, I don't even know if we have tweets tonight for the show, but, uh, I'll, I'll, he usually gets his tweets read first here on the podcast. Um, yep, so, uh, we'll continue on here. And Fabian Eichner actually had a pretty impressive showing here. Um, I mean... Everybody expected to be a squash match and to showcase Almas, and he kind of looked stunned a few points of this match. Eichner had a few pretty sweet uh, spots. He did the one impressive with the springboard. Um, he did into the... I don't even know if it was like an elbow or whatever it was, but he like landed it perfectly on Almas off the top rope onto like the, the, the stage area, the ramp. And that was pretty sweet. The crowd kind of popped for that. And then he kind of did a um, um, did a backbreaker, an impressive springboard DDT. So Fabian Eichner actually got almost for a two count in this match. So then, but but as you figured, Zelina Vega gets on the the ring apron, distracts Fabian Eichner, and he hits the hammerlock DDT for the. A uh, hard-fought victory against uh, Fabian Eichner. I've seen mixed reviews on this match, as far as people's opinions on, you know, almost didn't really look that good in this match. You know, he let this random guy almost like get a, a near fall on him. Everybody thought that it should have been a showcase for almost really dominating. But I, I don't know. I, I thought it was good that Eichner got a few moves in there. I didn't want to see a complete squash by Almas. And it shows that, you know, he has to work for it. He's not just going to be handed everything. And I, I I didn't have a problem with it, to be honest. Um, but I thought it was a pretty decent opening match, considered what it looked like from the beginning. From when Eichner came out, I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be squash. But he, he showed, a, showed people some stuff last night. So maybe this will be... The start of you know future push for for Fabian Eichner if he gets a character I really don't know what his character is he seems kind of bland but as far as entering ability and his look I, th- I think he's got it so we'll see what happens uh, with him going forward and then we had a legit squash match this was like Braun Strowman versus hot sweaty men jobber dudes on Monday Night Raw um, glorious one is here welcome glorious Greg. Doing my best with, o- with O'Kyle tonight. So Oni Lorcan and Danny Birch, who have become like the new Sheamus and Cesaro after fighting for weeks and months on end, have become joined forces to become a, uh, basically the jobbing tag team. I mean, both these guys are pretty good wrestlers, but me personally, I, I can't get invested because they really—I don't really know what their character is. I really can't get involved. And Oni Lorcan reminds me of like a poor man Cesaro. I mean, no offense to Oni Lorcan, but like, I don't know. He just reminds me of like. A Cesaro 2.0 with a little bit less charisma. You guys can agree with me or not. And Danny Birch, I'm, I don't really know a lot about Danny Birch. I just know him and Oni Lorcan are basically, you know, good in-ring technicians. But as far as characters, I really don't think it's there yet. And they faced the former uh, NXT Tag Team Champions, the authors of... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the authors of Pain with Paul Ellering, who is by far the worst manager in WWE right now. Not even close. The guy does adds nothing. He's pointless. He's boring. So the authors of Sleep in this match, uh, coming off their their unbelievable pff, War Games match, I guess you could say, with teaming up with Roderick Strong, which still to this day, I still don't know why it makes any sense. It was more awkward than Kurt Angle being a part of the Shield. Either way, the authors of pain squashed him. Like, there's really nothing else to say in this match. I mean, I guess this was basically a showcase for AOP 
to the casual crowd that watched it on USA Tonight to see, like, wow, these guys could be something. And we predict all the time that AOP is probably going to get called up at some point, and they're probably going to be bodyguards for somebody. And they're just going to be that dominant tag team. And I mean, yeah, they're improving, but I, I still just think they're boring, and I can't get behind these guys. But I can see why people are interested in the tag team going forward. They actually kind of got more cheers than I've heard them ever get uh, last night. So, I mean, good for them, I guess. Uh, man, it, the authors of Boar managed by Rico. <sighs> I don't even know what to say about that. Next, uh, what else do we have after that? I'm pretty sure we had a backstage segment. Uh phew. Oh, wait, no. We had that women's match. We had uh, Peyton Royce against Ember Moon, who is the new uh, NXT Women's Champion. Um, I don't know. This match really just didn't do anything for me, to be honest. I mean, Ember Moon, great finisher, and I love that she's champion, but I really just don't understand what her character is. Like, on the mic, like I, it's just not there for me yet. Maybe, maybe when she gets into a long feud with somebody and I can get invested in what she says, but, like, I don't know, I just don't know how to get into her character right now. I, I, I like her finisher a lot, and I want to like Ember Moon, because she she has all the in-ring tools to be a great women's champion, but it's just, like, I don't even really know what she's about right now. Like, is she gonna be a perma baby face? Is she gonna, you know, be a heel? Like, I really, I don't know. I want to see what they do going forward with her. Is this Peyton Royce and Billy Kay thing gonna continue? Because after Ember Moon won this match... Billy Kay basically came in the ring and tried to beat down on Ember Moon. And then out of nowhere, this was probably the best part in the whole thing, Nikki Cross comes out and just, like, lays out uh, Peyton Royce and and Nick and um, Billy Kay and then kind of just stands there and, like, with her psycho look on her face, stares at Ember Moon and then just runs away through the crowd. So it gives that, like, mystique and, like, Okay, what what is Nikki Cross's real, you know, ulterior motives with this whole thing? Uh, but like, I don't know. I, I really liked it. I thought that you know this builds towards next week, and it's like, okay, what is Nikki really doing? Is she on Ember's side, or is she just trying to get at Billy Kay and Ember or Billy Kay and Peyton Royce so that she could be the next one in line for a women's championship? So I don't think it's over between these four. I could definitely see. Probably a fatal four-way or triple threat if they don't include Billy Kay uh, for the NXT Women's Title. Uh, these are the t- definitely the top three right now in the women's division on NXT. Um, oh, they never showed a women's match. Okay, that's interesting. They never showed a women's match on the USA version. That is interesting. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I guess that's uh, that's the one thing that we got different by watching it on the network. I don't know why they wouldn't add a women... Why would they not show it? Like, oh my god, Vince and his time constraints, man. See what happens when they put NXT on the, on a cable network that Vince has, you know, control over what they're showing? They time constraints. They take out a women's match. There you go. So much for the women's revolution. <sighs> Apologize for you guys that didn't get to see that, but that was interesting. And then, uh, yeah, Michael Chow, we'll get into the what happened afterwards. We finally got... You know, that whole reveal for Shayna Baszler is going to be debuting soon with the whole Queen of Spades thing. And honestly, Shayna Baszler is badass. Uh, I can't wait for her to be a dominant women's champion at some point. Um, I really thought that she should have been the leader of that group that attacked the, on SmackDown. Because to me, Ruby Riot isn't a good leader. Like, I can't take her seriously as a leader. Like... It's just something about her. Like, I'm just not a fan. And and I just can't get behind the SmackDown trio that they had debut. Like, none of them intimidate me or or make it seem like they're badasses. Like, if Shayna Baszler would have been the leader of that SmackDown group, like, instantly credible to me. It's just like, I don't know. Maybe they're, are they really going to save her for this four horsewomen versus four horsewomen crap at WrestleMania? But even then, like, I I still think she could have possibly been the, the leader of this group. Ruby Riot just... She's she's not leader material to me. Like it's just I I can't stand Ruby Riot, and I'm sorry to you people who who like Ruby Riot out there. She just she's, she's not that great in my opinion. Like she's not credible as a as a leader of a faction. So I think Shayna Baszler definitely would have been better in that in that spot. 
Either way, we're going to get Shayna Baszler's debut at some point, and I expect her to be a dominant NXT Women's Championship. I think she'll take that championship no problem from whoever has it at that point. Um, Shayna versus Finn. Who's got the better club? Well, I don't know. Shayna doesn't really have a club right now, but we'll see. But um, two thumbs up for Shayna Baszler, man. She is a legitimate badass, credi- like instantly credible woman to bring to the SmackDown, um, SmackDown, I wish it was SmackDown, NXT Women's Division, so can't wait to see what Shayna Baszler does in the future, because I think she's going to be a major star on NXT, uh, we also had a backstage, (laughs) I don't even know what you can call it, it was like, the Street Profits were doing, I was kind of like half paying attention to this segment, the Street Profits were talking about like street I don't even remember what the hell it was. It was just a random, like, two, like, minute and a half segment. If somebody can remind me of what it was, I don't even remember what it was. But I just remember the Street Profits doing some backstage promo. I think it was called, like, Street Talk or something like that. I don't know what it was, but either way, I don't really remember much about that. The only other thing that I remember from a backstage segment during this uh, NXT episode was the whole... Sanity uh, backstage promo, which I thought was cool. Basically hyping up... Yeah, street talk. Yeah, there we go. So who knows what they're going to do with that. Uh, So Sanity was backstage basically hyping up their match next week, uh, which should be a sick match. Um, And I love how NXT, like, builds from week to week. Like, they're not giving us everything in one week. You know, they say, okay, two weeks you're going to get this, and then uh, not next week, the week after that, we're going to get Tyler Bate, or... Sorry, Lars Sullivan versus uh, Roderick Strong for uh, the last spot in the Fatal 4-Way for the NXT Championship. And then next week we're going to get Tyler Bate versus Pete Dunne in a rematch for the UK Championship. Like, I just love how NXT gets you invested to watch week after week after week and not just give away everything on one episode and then just have lazy booking like Raw and SmackDown do for weeks on end and not even make you want to turn on the television to watch it. So I really enjoyed uh, Sanity's backstage <laughs> segment with Eric Young, just talking crazy. Nikki Cross acting like a psychopath, running around like running around the group and grabbing Alexander Wolf's beard and shit like that. It was it was just hilarious, typical Sanity promo, and it builds towards their tag team match uh, next week. So that should be a really good match too. Ah, take a sip of water here. It's, it's harder than than it than it. Uh, than you think to host the show by yourself. So newfound respect for Kyle for doing this. And then we'll get into the the number one contender uh, qualifier match main event between Aleister Black and Adam Cole. Wow, was this ever a good match. And the ending of this match shocked the hell out of me. I thought for sure something was going to happen as far as Roderick Strong or somebody screwing Adam Cole over. I thought there was no way Aleister Black would win clean over Adam Cole. Two guys that are undefeated in NXT so far. Uh, but Kyle and I both said there's no way Aleister Black could lose this match. Uh, there's Like with the momentum he has right now, just a loss would kill him right now. And uh, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish were banned from ringside uh, by uh, my boy William Regal, He's the GM. So that was also good. So it was one-on-one. And, uh, basically, Adam Cole looked really good for the, for controlled most of the match. It was, like, I don't know. It seemed like he was too dominant to win the match, if that makes sense. Um, and then Aleister Black in the second half of the match fought back. I really can't remember any spots that happened, I apologize. Uh... But the way that black mass that he hit at the end, where Adam Cole basically said, you know, is that all you got? Like, come on, come at me. And wow, what a roundhouse kick that was. Oh, my God. So I think he caught Adam Cole off guard on this one and picks up the victory. And I think uh, Adam Cole didn't take Aleister Black seriously enough, and it cost him. So I think they're going to play off that. And I really think that, Alistair Black getting this win really shows that they're really high on him going forward, especially beating Adam Cole, who's, you know, the the leader of this up-and-coming faction. I don't know if Adam Cole is going to try to uh, say that he was screwed by not having his guys at ringside, or he's going to say Alistair Black got lucky or whatever, but I really don't think it's going to hurt Adam Cole that much. Uh, I thought if Aleister Black would have lost, it would have killed him completely. So I'm really glad that they made Aleister Black win if somebody had to lose this match. Um, 
but Adam Cole losing still shocked my mind. I really didn't think that they were going to do it clean. And wow, Aleister Black picking it up with the Black Mass was just awesome. So Aleister Black advances to the uh, Fatal 4-Way along with uh, Killian Dane and Johnny Gargano. So it's already shaping up to be an unbelievable match. And it's going to either be Lars Sullivan or Roderick Strong getting that last spot in a couple weeks. We'll find out then. But this looks like it's going to be a really good match for the number one contendership for the NXT title. Um, I really think it's going to be a face, though. I really don't think Killian Dane or if Lars Sullivan moves on. Um, excuse me. I really don't think that it's going to be them facing a heel, perma heel champion like Almas. Just wouldn't make sense to me. Um, so I really think that Gargano or Aleister Black is going to get the win at this point, and I really think it's probably going to be Aleister Black. I mean, how can you not, um, you know, derail this guy's momentum right now? He's like the hottest guy in NXT, undefeated, and I think he's going to be the next challenger for Almas. I do think Lars Sullivan and Killian Dane are probably going to start a feud coming out of that Fatal Four Way. I think one of the one or the other is going to like screw each other over, or they're going to brawl and. I really think that could be a good feud going forward because realistically, what else does, does Lars Sullivan, if he's not going for the NXT title, who's he going to face? Like, realistically, besides Killian Dane, which would be a really good match and feud, who else would he be able to face on this level right now since there isn't really a mid-card title? Unless you count the, U, the United States, or United States, United Kingdom Championship. But it seems like it's only really defended against UK guys in that one time against Gargano. So who knows who's even eligible to wrestle for that belt? Um... Adam probably has amnesia and might forget the whole thing next week. Yeah, you definitely see them playing off that, and Adam Cole is kind of going to shrug it off, and they're probably going to go on to have their feud with Sanity and probably eventually take their tag titles. But I don't think this is the end for Adam Cole, obviously. I think he's going to be the future NXT champion at some point, maybe at the TakeOver in New Orleans for WrestleMania, or even the one after that. I don't think I don't, I think, I don't think it hurts Adam Cole at all, because I think everybody expects him to be the guy in NXT moving forward into 2018. Uh, so, other than that, I really don't know as far as... As far as what else to talk about as far as NXT, I mean, uh, I miss No Way Jose. Yeah, we, we all miss No Way Jose, although his his character's, his character's pretty stupid, but his, his, uh, everybody seems to get behind his catchphrase and his song. But uh, for next week, NXT looks pretty good. And, and this week, like I, I, I'm not going to say it was bad, but I just expected more. As far as what they were going to give us for the casuals that were watching on the USA Network, I really thought they were going to make it like a jam-packed, huge episode. And they showcased a few of the champions, but not all. And again, back to what I said, I'm glad they don't give it away all in one episode. But I think for like a one-off like this where it was going to be on the USA Network, I really thought they were going to you know, do a lot with it as far as um, you know, showcasing what NXT is all about. And I think they did an okay job at that, but I think it could have been a lot better in my opinion. And f- and for that, I mean, out of five, I'd probably give NXT maybe a three and a half to four this week. I mean, it was good, but it was it left me wanting more, and there was things that I that I really wish they would have done done more with. But again, the time constraints didn't help. Maybe they could have even made it a two hour episode this week because it was on USA Network. But I don't know what plays on the USA Network at eight o'clock but probably some some terrible show that nobody wants to watch anyway but they still got to show it so uh i guess we'll get into that part of the the show but i don't have the music like kyle does i'm sorry i apologize uh for the list of 10 i don't have the music again and the little uh little jingle he has with the jericho and the ty dillinger so you're gonna get it without the jingle today so i don't know if kyle wants to put it in for the video version or not. If not, we're just we're just doing it live today, folks. We're doing it live. I'm doing my best here. So with that, we'll get into my list of ten. And my ten moment this week. I don't even know. We didn't watch SmackDown. We went to Simpsons Trivia that night. Once a month. Simpsons Trivia is probably better than watching, you know, Jinder and the Singh brothers try to beat up on AJ. Um trying to think back to what happened to Raw this week, if there was anything remotely good on the show. I don't really think so. Uh, Joe looked great. 
I'll say that. Joe looked awesome this week. Uh, the way he kicked the crap out of uh, Jason Jordan and uh, was it Roman Reigns? I think I can't remember. Honestly, like this week's just been a blur. I can't remember anything that happened on SmackDown this week. Oh God! See what happens if you don't have a co-host. It uh, just messes with you. But I guess this is the NXT show. I'll give my ten moment. Um, definitely to that Aleister Black and Adam Cole match. It was a very, very good match. I'm not going to say it was, you know, deserves to be in match of the year, but especially for a main event, SmackDown. Uh, God, why do I keep saying SmackDown? For NXT, Jesus. For NXT, it was definitely a good main event, and no complaints about the main event, really. That was probably the highlight of the show, uh, and what really, you know, it ended well for everybody, and I think that the casuals who watched on a USA Network this week really saw... Two guys that are the future of the NXT uh, championship title picture right there with Aleister Black and Adam Cole. So Aleister Black and Adam Cole this week are getting my 10 moments. So I'll give it a perfect 10 for Aleister Black and Adam Cole and that great match they had and the way it ended, the way Aleister Black won clean. It was just so well done. And I was shocked. I really didn't think that Adam Cole was going to lose clean, but it made sense, and they made it work, so I'm okay with it. Uh, my list moment this week, God, where do I start? Yeah, Cupid Girl, I don't blame you for not cutting the women's match for NXT this week. Yeah, I, I feel bad for anybody that had that match cut. I mean, it wasn't a great match or anything, but still, the fact that they wouldn't even show the women's match on... <laughs> On the show, when it was already taped for the show, but then they showed it on the network after. It's kind of fishy. I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, Matt Hardy. Uh, definitely, everybody's getting excited for the Woken thing. I mean, I don't, I don't know who isn't right now. Oh, yeah. My list moment this week. Absolutely. I just remembered it now. So, we had that whole women's segment thing going on. We had that tag team match. Uh, I don't even remember remember about it now. Or no, it was Asuka jobbed Alicia Fox for you know because Alicia Fox really needed to be jobbed by Asuka again. Great booking there. So after the match, Asuka's out there, and then the, the Absolution Evolution thing comes out, and they get in the ring with Asuka, and then like Sasha's music hits, and like all the women come out, and this is where I. I'm just completely, like, mind-fucked in this one. Why the hell is Nia Jax all of a sudden put into this thing? She has been nowhere to be found with any of the attacks or any of the matches going on. I thought the whole reason they put her in this godforsaken, horrendous dumpster fire love story thing we're going to get with her and Enzo Amore, I thought that was the whole point to get her off of TV right now, or to get her off of the women's division, and to have her written off basically for now, to put her with Enzo so that they have something for her to do. But then she's all of a sudden in the ring with all the women that were attacked, facing off against abs uh, Absolution, like she has like beef with them. It's like, where does she come from? Like, why was she all of a sudden just there? She has done nothing with this entire thing for the last three weeks or month that it's been going on. And then all of a sudden, we're just supposed to forget that, oh yeah, uh, Nia's all of a sudden in it again. Like, what? I just was sitting there shaking my head. It's like, what's the point of putting Nia in this whole Enzo thing to keep her away from the whole women's storyline and then just have her show up in the ring with all the women fighting off the faction? Like, Nia doesn't need to be doing that. And if you wanted to have her in it, they should have been attacking her from the beginning. She hasn't even had a match in a month. That's my list moment this week. You know what? You just made the list. There you go, WWE, for somehow just making us try to forget that Nia Jax was nowhere to be found in this whole storyline for the last three three weeks, four weeks. And I don't, I really don't want them to do this whole Enzo and Nia thing, but it seems like they're, they're really just continuing with it, and maybe she's going to... Start dating, and I don't even want to think about it. How you doing? Nia's terrible acting job on that. And yeah, Dana Brooke, too. Where the hell has she been? She really hasn't been in it either, but especially Nia, because the whole reason behind the Enzo storyline was to keep her out of the women's picture so that she wasn't going to get, you know, squashed or, you know, beaten up by these three 
uh, returning women or debuting women. It just made no sense. Why the why was she there? I'm I'm just done. I'm I can't even talk about it anymore. I just I'm done ranting about it. But that definitely made the list for me. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever to have Nia just randomly show up again. WWE thinks we're stupid. Another honorable mention list moment this week goes to fucking Kane being in the main event again. The f- why is Kane continuing to be on television in these like marquee matches and main events of? Raw facing Braun Strowman with the winner going on to face Brock Lesnar at Royal Rumble. I didn't even watch this match. I literally didn't even watch this match because I was like, I'm not, I'm not watching this. Like, I don't care. I don't want Braun to win because I don't want him to go on and get squashed by Brock because we all know Brock's holding the title to Mania until we get the coronation of Roman Reigns again. You know, everybody wants to see that crap. And then I don't want Kane to go on to face Brock Lesnar because it's fucking Kane. Why does he need to have a universal title match in 2018? The poor guy doesn't even want to be on TV anymore. Oh, it just gave, gave me a headache. Like, of all the people that are so much more deserving of a title shot than Kane, if you want to put Kane on TV, fine. He, the casuals like him, whatever. But why does Braun Strowman need to be fighting him again? He's already fought Big Show for months on end, and as uh, much as Kyle loves his boy Big Show facing Braun Strowman, then we have to, does he have to go through every single big guy? Are we gonna get Mark Henry and Great Khali coming back to to go in feuds with Braun Strowman? Like nobody wants to see that. It just I'd rather I'd rather Braun just go on and have like a great Universal Title run, but. We all know that that's not happening for a while, and now that he's babyface, I don't know what they're doing with the whole Braun Strowman babyface thing, but it's just, the whole universal title thing is a complete clusterfuck. Samoa Joe, if anybody, should be challenging Brock again, because that feud they had for that one month of Great Balls of Fire was just fantastic, and then they never continued it after, and Joe just continued to cut these great promos, and he's a legitimate badass that could actually go up against Brock Lesnar, same with Braun Strowman, but... (sighs) We all know that they're not winning the title from Brock, and it's going to be Roman versus Brock at WrestleMania for Intercontinental Championship for Universal Title, title for title match, and I'm going to walk out. Simple as that. I'm not going to be watching that. And yeah, we get this mi- whole mixed uh, mixed tag tournament thing going on. It's like a Facebook exclusive. The rosters were announced. Everybody's flipping out because it should be you know, Braun and Nia together, and it'd be the two squashing everybody, but they will probably, for storyline-wise, they'll probably put Nia with Enzo, and it'd just be cringe as, as all hell, as far as that. But, on SmackDown, I did like, when I went back and watched um, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn continuing to, you know, poke at the bear, you should say at Shane McMahon, and coming out with the Yep t-shirts, and doing the whole Yep chant, and Daniel Bryan basically putting himself as another referee in the match. So that should be interesting for Sunday. That's really the only match I'm really interested in to seeing what they do with it. Clash of Champions does is, is not doing it for me right now, but I'm still going to watch it. But I really don't have any expectations going into it. Jinder's going to win this title back. I'm calling it right now. Because, um, you know, WWE loves to, for whatever reason, they love Jinder Mahal right now. And, uh, yeah, I really am interested to see what Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon both as as two special guest referees do. I'm really interested to see what they end up doing with that. I would really love to see Daniel Bryan and Shane finally get some tension there. Maybe Daniel goes with KO and Sammy since, you know, he does relate to them as, you know, great in-ring performers that are getting shot down by authority right now. But, I don't know, could Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon be up to something... I don't know. That's why I'm really interested to see what happens in this match because if Sammy and KO lose, then obviously they're gone from the company. But we all know that's not happening. So if something's going to happen in this match. The KO and Sammy are going to win, and I think Daniel Bryan's going to help them win. Maybe not heel wise, but him and Shane are going to get some tension, and Daniel's going to end up helping them get the pin. And yeah, Orton turning on Nakamura. <sighs> Randy Orton. Crickets for Randy Orton, man. I got nothing else to say about him. Nakamura, they just completely killed that guy. Um, I, I say all the time, like, I'm not the biggest Nakamura fan, but I do see his appeal and why people, like, the aura of Nakamura, but they've just completely killed him with the loss of gender and what they've been doing with him now and having him come out every week, and now his entrance isn't even as special anymore. 
it just seems like they they didn't know what they did or what to do with Nakamura, and now I really hope maybe they have him win the Royal Rumble. And you know, we all want the Styles and Nakamura match at Mania, but who knows if WWE actually wants to go down that road with those two? But uh, the scream from the Jobber and the Bludgeon Brothers match. Oh yeah, if anybody didn't know that, Colin Delaney returned this week from his ECW 2008 atrocious run. He had his hair cut. And he was one of the people that got squashed by the Bludgeon Brothers. Did a backstage interview after and says, you haven't seen the last of Colin Delaney. So let me guess, Colin Delaney is going to be the next James Ellsworth. Great. We also got, uh, if anybody cared, Tony Neat, as I call him. I love Tony Neat. Got exiled from the Zotrain faction this week on 205 Live, if anybody actually watches that show. So yeah, nobody cares about that, so uh, I think that's probably going to be it. The Aura of Nakamura. Cap, you just made a shirt Logan, <laughs> shirt slogan. And it kind of just came off, rolled off of, off my tongue pretty well there. So, and again, I'll check the No Holds Barred account, but uh, I really don't think there are any tweets this week. So, uh, as I go through... Yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can ask me in here. Why not? But yeah, Drew Gulak, that guy is so over. Oh my god, I love Drew Gulak. I want to really see his PowerPoint presentation. I really hope that at WrestleMania they have this giant PowerPoint presentation on the big screen. That would just be amazing. Drew Gulak is so over. Uh, with such a stupid, you know, geeky gimmick. I'm sure if he ever met up with the Gallows and Anderson, he'd be called a nerd. But... Drew Gulak is probably one of the only exciting spots in 205 Live this right now, and got the debut of Hideo Itami coming up, but, I mean, the whole Zotrain thing is just, ugh, just cancerous to 205 Live right now. Yeah, let's hope for a better 205 Live, Greg, I agree. So, I really don't really have anything else to talk about, so if anybody else has any questions they want to ask me for, wrap the show up, go ahead. Uh, no tweets this week. But uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask, and I'll answer a few questions before I wrap up the show here. Drew Gulak. God. Yeah, I really want to know what they're going to do with that mixed tag tournament. Like, I know it's for charity and everything, but, like, why do I care? Like, I know people are interested to see the pairings, but at the end of the day, what are they fighting for? What's the point of it? Oh, it just has no appeal to me whatsoever. Yeah, I'm ready for the Slammies, Greg. It's going to be an awesome time. There's 31 total awards, which includes the Participation Award winners and the Twitter Fan of the Year. So that's going to be pretty awesome. And yeah, we've been having these, been going through nominations for the whole year. So the, the Slammy Show is my favorite show of the year because we put a lot of time into it with our nominations and getting the past winners still and being able to to list off the archives. Excuse me. It's just an awesome show, an awesome time. And it really is a uh, basically a great end of the year for us to uh, kind of end off on a good note with a, a big show like that. So you guys definitely got to look for the tweet for that. When do you think of Alexa Bliss face turn? They had Alexa come out with the women. Yeah, that also, I was like, what the? F I don't know. I feel like Alexa should be a lone wolf by herself, you know, Baron Corbin style. Like, why was she coming out and helping out the other women that she shit on for months and months on end? That didn't make any sense to me either. Alexa Bliss heel turn, as long as she keeps the same character, I'm okay with it. And if she continues to, you know, still be that bitch you know, type of heel, maybe even a tweener, because I really don't think she, her as a face would be anything good. We saw what she was like with the whole sparkle, glitter, bliss, crap gimmick in NXT that she started with. So I really don't want her to turn, because I feel like they would just water down her, uh, her character a lot. But if they can find a way to not you know, make it stale and dry and basically keeping it the same. Maybe like an Ambrose type face where he's not really a face. He just doesn't give a fuck about anybody. I'd be okay with Alexa being like that kind of heel. Um, Michael Chow asks, 
How would you have booked the mixed tag tournament? I would have had the winners get title shots. Charity is good, but kind of lame when the finish is predetermined. I 100% agree, Michael Chow. The fact that they're not fighting for anything besides charity, like, why does it want make anybody want to tune in and be invested in it? It doesn't make any sense to me. Unless they were going to continue it with something on, on uh, you know, Raw or SmackDown, then what's the point of doing it? Maybe they do be, both of them be, do become number one contenders. You know, maybe if it was, just off the top of my head, Braun and Bailey for some reason, then maybe Braun and should get a title shot and Bailey should get a title shot. So it gives them something to fight for because realistically, if it's if they're supposed to be in kayfabe and it's supposed to be storyline based, then they're fighting for charity. Like that, that's not a storyline. They should be fighting for what they're doing on TV right now. It's just. It seems like it. It's just way too far gone from the actual storyline that's going on. You can't really have like two completely separate things going on, unless it's like Xavier Woods' gaming channel, which is, you know, has better characters than the main roster half the time. Uh, but I 100% agree that the mixed tag should have been for something, and you know, crossed over to TV, not just this Facebook live crap. The other question from Michael Chow, who is our Twitter fan of the year for 2017, who is graciously stepping down from uh, his Twitter fan of the year, and we'll pass it on to the next winner. Uh, he also has his own wrestling podcast, WWE MC TV. He does a very good in-depth review of Raw SmackDown. He reads your tweets. He has total news. He has contests. He has everything. So if you really want to listen to some in-depth reviews, definitely go listen to uh, WWE MC TV from our boy Michael Chow TV. Uh, he's available on Spreaker as well. Uh, he says, uh, since Kane versus Braun ended in DQ, do you think the triple it will be a triple threat now? Yes. Unfortunately, I think for sure it is going to be a triple threat. So we have the return of Brock Lesnar next week, if anybody cares. Paul Heyman will probably cut a great promo, but nobody will give a shit. And Kane and Braun will come out, and it will set up a triple threat at Royal Rumble. Which, I mean, is kind of better, because at least Braun is in the match, but he wasn't have to lose. So Kane can take the pin to Brock and still have Braun look okay, and not just being Braun versus or Brock versus Kane. Cause God, who wants to see that? So I'm okay with the triple threat. It's better than either match we could have gotten because the outcomes of both were just terrible. So I'm okay with the triple threat because Brock can still retain without pinning Braun, and they they can have their love affair putting Kane in the match for whatever stupid reason they want Kane in the Universal Title picture in 2018 now basically. Uh, if Finn and Oscar would had won, then Finn versus Lesnar and Oscar versus Bliss for the titles. Well, I think Oscar's definitely going to be a slow build. She's probably going to win the title at Mania. Um, I think it's too early for her, just like when it was too early for Bailey to win it, in my opinion, last year. And that really killed Bailey's momentum by winning it so soon. The fact that she had to win it at Fastlane from Charlotte before it, you know, would have just made sense for her to win at WrestleMania, but, you know, that wasn't smart booking or anything. And Fastlane also was the worst pay per view of the year because it killed so many different things that were going on. Uh,. And yeah, I don't think Finn's ever going to get his rematch, especially when Lesnar's the champion, because they, in WWE's eyes, they don't see Brock versus Finn as a credible match. So, have you guys seen a, Mi a, a Chris Miz story? They posted it, yes, I saw it, and I want to unsee it. I'm sorry. CM Punk chance for days on Raw next week with Brock Pro. <laughs> I really don't want to hear CM Punk chants anymore. That's just long gone. And last question from Cupid Girl, I guess. Do you think Mojo has a chance of being a heel? Personally, I'm not the right person to ask because I've never been a fan of Mojo Raleigh. I guess maybe he has potential to be a heel. I mean, the character he was using as a face couldn't get much worse, so maybe a change of scenery for him might get people invested in him, but I, I still don't. Not getting behind Mojo Raleigh as a singles competitor, I really don't think he's that great he's just basically all hype and running to the ring and basically like an ultimate warrior in my opinion the guy's not the greatest in-ring technician he has a good look and he basically runs around and gets people hype so to me mojo raleigh i mean i'll remain optimistic for mojo raleigh maybe giving me a chance as a heel becoming a heel and this you know feud with zach Ryder, but i really just don't care about it right now maybe they do something the next couple weeks to build it up but 
I'm not really optimistic about Mojo Rawley. I really don't think that he was should have been a singles competitor that was called up regardless. The fact that he won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal last year with help from Rob Gronkowski. The, the fact that Braun didn't win that just made no sense to me, but um, I don't really think Mojo Rawley is going to be uh, much of a contender from here on in. Uh, I, I just personally don't see it. <sighs> so... That is 45 minutes long, and I think I'm going to wrap it up there, folks. So uh, thank you for listening uh, to the Lowdown Show Remix on No Holds Barred Wrestling Podcast. Uh, Your Canadian WWE podcast that talks about the WWE and NXT and No Holds Barred on anything we say, pun intended. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at No Holds Barred WP. You can also follow myself the blissful boss mr corporate himself corporate cappy at corporate cappy and my usual co-host kyle masters you can follow him at real kyle masters on twitter he is a self-proclaimed greatest host and does a fabulous job hosting the show a lot better than i did tonight but uh he'll be back next week folks so don't worry you can also follow the podcast on instagram at no holds barred wp all one word if you're into that instagram kind of thing i actually just posted a new picture of uh, the two chase figures I got, so you can go check that out. I uh, I'm kind of into that Instagram kind of thing right now, so I like to keep active on there. So if you want to listen to the podcast on the go, you can listen to it on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker. We're always on the live app for Spreaker, uh, which is available for all Apple and Android devices. It's a fantastic free app. You can sign in and chat with us every week during our live shows. I highly recommend it. And all video version uh, content is available at youtube.com slash NHBWP. So go give us a subscribe and hit that bell icon for all upload updates. We just hit over 500 subs, so it's a huge accomplishment for us. And thank you to all who listen, you know, have hel- who have helped us get there through the last couple years. Maybe we can get to 1,000 someday. So until next time, I'm the Blissful Boss, Mr. Corporate himself, Corporate Cappy. And, I ho- and the self-proclaimed greatest host hopefully feels better next week's show for our big end-of-the-year slammy show coming up. So to end, we're always reminding you to keep it on the lowdown. <laughs>